I've just finished making this coffee table with a built-in drawer. I'll explain why this won't open later on. Let's check it out. To keep within budget for my client on this one, I'm using a single sheet of plywood and a bunch of 2x4s. The first thing I needed to do was to break down my sheet of plywood into the key pieces. This consisted of cutting it down using the track saw initially. It really annoys me how this Herbauer track saw has the dust port pointing towards your hand and due to the design of it there's no way to rotate it so it pops off every now and then if I catch it with my hand or anything like that. Once I've made the plywood more manageable I took it to the table saw and cut my pieces to final length and width. I needed two end pieces and two shells for the initial carcass. I'm going to go back and cut the drawer pieces later on. Once I cut all the key panels I needed to make some legs. My client wanted chunky legs for this table and seeing as this will be painted I simply laminated two 2x4s together. I slathered one of these bad boys with a load of glue and spread it out thoroughly using a silicon spatula that I stole from the kitchen and never gave back. It's perfect for these types of jobs. Then it was just a case of getting every single clamp I own and clamping it all up. Once I clamped it within an inch of its life I left it for a few hours to start going off and came back to remove the clamps. I was a bit concerned that the weather was a bit cold and the glue may not fully cure properly so I removed the clamps as they'd done their job and then it was just a case of sneaking into the house and hiding it in the spare bedroom without my wife spotting me. Once I was happy that it was fully dry I took it back into the workshop and realised it was too thick to cut down on my mitre saw so I took my circular saw and a speed square to trim them to smaller more manageable pieces. I made sure to cut these a good few inches longer than the final length so that I can account for any planar snipe when I run them through the thickness of later on. Once I cut my four legs, I needed to remove the rounded edges from the 2x4, so I ran them through the table saw to neaten them all up. I did this on both sides, which left me with four legs that were a bit wider than they were deep, so the next step was to run them through the thickness planer, rotating them so that I can get them completely square. And then I was left with four perfectly square legs. You can't see it very well here, but there's some planar snipe at both ends of the legs, so I just marked out where this starts and ends, and then I just made sure I had enough space in the middle for the leg length I wanted. And what do you know? I did, almost like I planned for it. I marked out where I wanted to make the cuts and then took them to the mitre saw. The saw still wasn't quite cutting all the way through, so I needed to make an initial cut and then rotate the legs before finishing the cut off. The legs were done now, so it was time to assemble them. To do this, I'm going to use good old pocket holes as they're convenient, quick and easy. I ran them through my Craig 720 Pro, which is an absolute beast of a pocket hole jig. I did three pocket holes on either side of my end panels. Then I needed to cut some stretcher pieces for the leg assembly, so I took the end of four of my remaining 2x4 boards, which would leave enough on each board for the tabletop, and then I cut them to the exact width of the plywood end panels. Once I'd cut them to length, I needed to rip off the rounded edges again, so I did this on the table saw. Next up, I lined the boards up with the legs to measure out the exact width so the stretchers match the legs exactly. I prefer to mark against the actual material rather than take the measurements wherever possible as it eliminates any mistakes, and as my memory is so terrible, I often take measurements and instantly forget it. I imagine a few of you have probably done the same at some stage, right? Not just me. I ripped the stretchers to their final width on the table saw and then test fit the total leg assembly. I didn't want the panel to be too deep so I placed it on top of my other end panel to raise it up a bit and then just checked everything would fit and line up okay. Once I was happy with everything I gave each component a run over with the random orbit sander. It's much easier to do than main sanding now before assembly. Don't ask me how I know. Here's some sanding. A bit more sanding. And a bit more sanding. Now came the time to build the leg assembly, which just involved adding glue to the end of the plywood and then lining it up with the legs. I used the stretchers to get everything lined up how I needed it, and then added my pocket hole screws which tightened it all up and meant I could keep on working. I did the same to both leg panels and then moved on to the stretcher pieces. I slathered them in glue and spread it out to cover the entire back of the stretcher, and then just attached them to the panels. I clamped them up and left them overnight. No need for screws or anything like that on these. Now. I like to always use some small scraps of plywood to protect my main workpiece when I'm clamping it up, especially when working with softwood like pine, as the clamps can leave indentations and you want to spread out the pressure with something like plywood to take that pressure directly off the wood. You can see here the indentation that it makes and it'd take a lot of sanding or planing to get that out of your main workpiece. Because this is being painted I thought I'd add a little bit of filler to the joints just to neaten them up. It's not really necessary as they're nice and tight anyway, but just gives a better finish when it's painted later on. Next up, I needed to do the base and the shelf, and this is where I think I massively overthought this. 
The easiest thing to do would have been just to add another piece of plywood onto the back of my M panels, which would give me a nice flat panel to attach the shelf and base to. Not to mention it would cover the pocket holes, but I decided in my infinite wisdom that I cut notches out of each corner and mess around lining this all up. It's not like people are going to see the notching out and say, oh, that guy did extra work on this. Well done. So really all I did was create a load of unnecessary work for myself. Oh well, I'm sure I'll have forgotten and done exactly the same thing the next time I make a similar project. After all, there's no cure for stupid. Anyway, I painstakingly measured and marked the corners. Then I cut them with the jigsaw, tested the fit, amended it, and finally got the fit I wanted. Then I drilled some more pocket holes at each end. However, because I'd notched the corners, but I wanted to screw them in, I needed to bust out the Craig 320 pocket hole jig. I've used this pocket hole jig to build entire pieces of furniture like this coffee table before, so it's more than up to the task, but it's just a bit more time consuming. Did I mention that notching out the corners was a complete waste of time? Once I drilled the pocket holes for these, I added some iron-on edge banding. I'll be linking to all the products I use in this video in the description, but I won't be including this edge banding as it's terrible. Normally I make my own edge banding, but I thought I'd use iron-on stuff as a bit easier generally, but unfortunately I got a bad one. I tried a few different ways to trim it down throughout this process, and none seemed to make a difference. For this first attempt I used a laminate trimmer on my router, However, all the methods resulted in the edge banding splitting along the grain at some point where it wanted rather than where I wanted. So I won't be using this particular edge banding again. Once I'd edge banded the base and the shelf, I attached them to the leg assembly, starting with the base, which I added a bead of glue and then screwed it into place. You'll note that I didn't have pocket holes to the notches on the base piece as there won't be any load bearing on it, so it didn't feel necessary. Then I added the other leg and flipped it over. It was already feeling pretty stable, so once the shelf was in, I knew it would be rock solid. To position the shelf, I cut some spacers from a scrap of 18mm MDF that I had lying around, and then it was just a case of slotting the shelf into place by adding glue and then screwing it into place. With the shelf on, I had two pocket holes that would be visible if you were to stick your head into the shelf. It probably wouldn't be seen by most people, but I thought that seeing as I was going to paint it anyway, I'd plug the holes. So to do this, I just took some 10mm dowels, squirted a blob of glue in the hole, and then tapped the dowels in place with a hammer. Just tap it in. Once the glue had dried, I came back and then cut them flush with a Japanese pull saw, which meant I could get really close to the plywood panel without causing damage. Then, to finish it off, I just took my block plane to it. That's the main carcass complete. Next up, I needed to move my attention to making the top, so I screwed a stop block to my mitre saw station, and then cut my 2x4 materials to rough length, making sure to leave them a little bit longer than I needed. Then I could trim off the rounded edges on the table saw. You know the drill by now. To neaten the boards up and to ensure they were exactly the same thickness, I ran them through my thickness planer. And there we are, lovely plain boards. To join them, I'm going to use glue and biscuits to make sure they all remain aligned. I marked out where I wanted my biscuits to go, and then mortised out for 20mm biscuits. Then I started the glue up. I went along gluing each biscuit in place and spreading plenty of glue along the edge of the board. Now, I'm going to level with you here, as I don't remember or not, but I really feel like I missed the glue on one of the boards and just glued the biscuits. Look, right there. I think I rotated the board the wrong way, but for the life of me, I could not pull it apart again. So we'll just have to see if it has any long-term effect or not, and whether I actually even did miss it out. Perhaps it'll just be one of those little mysteries that'll keep me up at night for the rest of my life. I had a couple of small imperfections on the knots from running them through the planer, so I rubbed in a bit of wood filler putty. I've used this one before and it's always worked well, so I trust that this will be a good one for this too. Then, once it dried, I gave it all an initial sanding down. Oh, hi Ben. Next step is the draw. This notching out of the bloody base and shelf has come back to bite me again. I needed something to screw the draw runners to, and because the main side panels are recessed back, I needed to add a filler piece for the draw runners to attach to. Fuck my life. I measured up the internal dimensions of the space and then cut two strips of plywood to fit by ripping them to width on the table saw and cutting to length on the mitre saw. Then I slathered some glue on and slapped them in place. Then I pinned them with my crappy Titan brad nailer which meant I needed to come back and hammer the nails in afterwards to seat them properly. Next up I needed to make the drawer box and I purposefully didn't cut the pieces to size until I had everything else assembled as I don't really work from a plan. I just have a little doodle and then figure it out as I go. I cut the pieces on the table saw to get the right width, but didn't cut them to length yet as I wanted to put a rebate in, and I figured I may as well do this on two longer boards rather than four shorter boards. 
To do the rebate, I set up my fence to cut in from the bottom and then I raised the blade to cut about halfway through my plywood and ran the boards through. I checked them against the plywood I'm using for the base and I needed to adjust the fence and run it through again. So I did that and just kept testing it until I had the perfect fit. Ooh, look at that. Then I marked up the measurements I needed for the sides, front and back and cut them to length on the miter saw. Once I'd done this, I added some more edge banding and this time I tried trimming it with a Stanley knife blade which was okay, but still not great. Remember how easy I said the Craig 720 was to use? Well, I thought I'd let one of my kids have a go on it. Barney is always really keen to help me with my projects, so I always try to include him wherever I can. He absolutely loved it. Soon, I won't actually have to do anything, and I can just claim all the credit for his work. I really enjoy working with my kids on my projects. Let me know in the comments if you get your kids involved with your projects. Good lad, Barney. With the pocket holes drilled, it was time to assemble the drawers. I've used a really simple method to do these drawers and I'd say it's probably the easiest way to do it. I make sure that the pocket holes are on the front and the back of the drawer as they won't be seen when it's all assembled and the front panel's added. Then I just add a bead of glue and screw them together. I left the back panel off so that I could line up the base and mark out the width I needed. This is much easier than measuring and trying to get the rebate measurements correct. I cut it to width on the table saw and then slotted it into the drawer and marked out the length so I could cut this on the table saw as well. I think I must have forgotten to film it but I did then trim the rebate off the back panel as it wasn't really needed and it makes it much easier to replace the draw bottom if I ever need to. Once I cut the rebated section off the back piece, I attached it in the same way as the front with glue and pocket screws. Once the back panel was on, I could slot the base in and then attach it with screws on the underside into the back panel. The rest is just held in place within the rebate. At this stage, I tested the draw fit by putting the draw runners in and then slotting the draw in. It did fit, but it was very snug and it would have just got stuck. So I must have got my measurements a couple of millimeters off. So the easiest way to rectify it was to cut a shallow rebate on either side of the draw box. To do this, I set my table saw blade to the height of the draw runners and then set my fence up so I could take half a blade tooth width off the side of the draw box and ran it through. Then I adjusted the fence again to do the same on the other side. I gave it another test and the fit was now perfect. So I installed the runners. These are soft closed ball bearing draw slides and they just need three screws to fit it to the table. The holes are elongated to have a bit of play in them for any minor adjustments that might be needed. I installed them on both sides of the table, then I slid in the drawer box and lined up the front of the runner with the front of the drawer and screwed the first screw in. Then I pulled it out a bit further and screwed the next screw in and so forth until both sides were attached. The next thing I needed to make was the drawer front. In order to do this, I took a piece of plywood and then a thin strip of quarter inch plywood to represent the rebate and I lined my table saw fence up to this measurement. I then ran a leftover piece of 2x4 through which left me the exact size for the thickest part of my drawer front around the frame. I did enough for two drawer fronts as I'll need one for the drawer itself and then one for the false drawer on the other side. I decided we needed a false drawer on the rear side as it'd look a bit odd if it was just plain or if I did two drawers, they'd be really shallow and not very helpful. So I talked it through with the client that I'm building this for and he agreed the false front would be best. I then trimmed these down to length on the miter saw. Once I cut enough of the two x four material to size for the full frame around my drawer fronts, I used some thin off cuts of the same width wood to measure up for the remaining space for the plywood panel. With this measurement, I then cut the plywood on the table saw and then did exactly the same method for the measurement for the length of the panel and cut that to size on the miter saw. Oh hello, someone's gone and got himself a new haircut. As a hobbyist, I tend to only get the chance to do this stuff in my evenings or if I have a spare time at the weekend. So you'll notice a few outfit changes and the occasional haircut during the filming of my longer projects. Not much continuity going on here, I'm afraid. Once I cut the plywood panels, I added pocket holes around the edges and then added a couple of pocket holes to the frame pieces to help join everything together. I could then lay out the frame and panel using the scraps of plywood as spacers to raise the panel up so it sits perfectly flat on the backside and we'll have the correct rebate on the front. Then I added glue and screwed them in to pull it all tight. To fit the drawer front, I squeezed out a bunch of super glue onto the back of the drawer front and used an active on the drawer itself, then lined it up using playing cards as spacers for the bottom and the sides and pushed it into place. The activator helps the super glue adhere instantly, which meant I could pull the drawer out and secure it in with screws from the back. Now, I put the false front on the back in place, and as you can see, there's the space around the edge that I'd done for the drawer front. Thinking about it, it'd probably been fine to have made this perfectly snug, but it wouldn't match the actual drawer, so I came up with the solution. It was pretty simple, really. All I did was cut a piece of plywood the exact size of the space, added some pocket holes, 
and then screwed it in with pocket holes from the inside. I've mentioned it before in previous videos, but this right angle driver adapter is perfect for things like this when you need to get into tight spaces. Once the backer was screwed in, I lined up the faults front using playing cards as a spacer, and then with a couple of clamps holding it in place, I screwed it in from behind. I had a couple of pocket holes on show on the back of the drawer front. Again, probably wouldn't be noticed, but as I was gonna paint it, I figured I may as well fill them with dowels as well. To prepare for when I attach the top, I mortised out some slots using my biscuit jointer. These will be used with these tabletop fasteners, also known as Z clips or Z clips, depending where you're from. It just gives enough room for any wood movement. I'll be attaching the top once the unit's been fully painted. Next up came arguably the hardest part of this entire project. I needed to turn the table upside down. Turns out I should have flipped the table over with the drawer on the other side. Well, that was awkward. At least no one saw it. The reason I awkwardly flipped the table upside down was so I could put a chamfer on the feet. I chucked up a 45 degree chamfer bit into my trim router and then ran round each foot. This just takes the edge off the feet. Not only does it make it look neater, but it drastically reduces the chances of the wood splintering when it's moved around. Next up, I wanted to get the wood ready for finish. So I corked all the seams with a standard decorator's cork and then used a knotting solution for the knots to stop them leaking through the paint in the future. Usually I use the Zinza BIM primer and sealer, but the paint the client gave me for this project has got a built-in primer, so I thought I'd just use the knotting solution instead. It's time to trim the top to its final size. I learned my lesson and flipped the unit over the easy way this time around. I always like to cut the top to final size once the main unit is built, just in case any of my measurements are out or if I make any changes during the build. I measured it out and then cut the ends with my track saw. Now you see the last two bits just come off separate to the rest. That's what makes me think I must have missed some glue off but I really tried to pull it apart and it definitely wasn't coming off. So I guess I'll just have to see how it goes over time. I'd already done the rough sanding, so I sprayed it to raise the grain and gave it another sand with 120 grit and then 200 grit. While I was at it, I ran over the rest of the unit with the sander, just to smooth any rough bits. Once I finished with the sanding, I started with the stain for the top. I bought this oak stain from Amazon and applied a single coat of it as per the instructions. I have to say, I really like the way this stain went on. No blotchiness and it applied really nicely and dried a lovely colour. I'll add a link to it in the description. While the stain was dry, and I set up my makeshift spray booth. I've got a new sprayer recently. It's the Urbauer EPS 800 sprayer and this will be the first project I've used it on. So it'll be an interesting test for it. I'll be using it on a few things and then I'll do a review video on it later on. If you're interested in seeing that video and any of my future videos, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I mentioned that the stain went on really well, but there were two issues. The first is that the color didn't quite match my client's flooring, which is what they wanted. So I knew I needed to do something else with it. And I also noticed that although the filler I used is suitable for stain, I found that this particular stain didn't change the colour of it at all. As you can see, it was a cold evening when I did this, so I bust out the hat and the coat. In order to darken the stain slightly and to ensure it stains the filler, I added a coat of the Georgian Oak Danish oil that you'll have seen me use in some of my other videos. This worked perfectly on darkening it and staining the filler. I left that to dry overnight and came back and added a couple of coats of varnish. Normally, I use Danish oil or varnish, but I only did a single coat of the Danish oil for the colour and went with varnish on the top. I denibbed and then added the final coat for a lovely smooth finish. Once that dried it was time to attach the top. I laid it out with an even overhang on all four sides and then grabbed the tabletop fasteners and screws and attempted to attach the top. I don't know why but I always give the original screws a chance with these types of things before I realise that they're always absolute crap and then swap them out for much better quality screws. It makes such a big difference. Don't settle for the standard screws they give you with stuff. My recommendation is to always use your own ones. My go-to screws are Torx head ones as you get a good connection between the driver bit and the screw. Once you go Torx you never go Borx. No, that doesn't work. I'll keep working on that. Anyway, once the top was securely fastened, I had one task left, and that was to fit the handles. I haven't got any fancy jigs for handles, so I just stuck some masking tape on and measured the position I needed the handles to be. I drilled in from the front and then attached them to the drawer front and for the false drawer front on the other side as well, just to complete the look. The final thing that anyone should do when they've made a piece of furniture with soft closed drawers is to open and close them a few times to get that sweet soft closed movement going. Oh yeah, check that baby out. Let's see it one more time. That's the stuff. Lovely, give it a little stroke. And there you have it, the completed coffee table with working drawer. If you hadn't guessed from the beginning, I had this the other way round and I was trying to open the false drawer front, which is why it wouldn't open. I really enjoyed doing this project and I think it went really well. If you enjoy projects and you wanna watch another video of mine, check this one out right here. If you want to subscribe, you'll get tool tips and advice, reviews and project videos. See you next time.